thoracoabdominal emergencies. I like to color code things by organ. You can see this is how we will break this down. The first group are thoracic emergencies, the next group intestinal emergencies, and lastly, viscous and vessel emergencies. I'm, if you've seen my presentations before, they're usually just straight case presentation, but I thought some additional information about the pathologies we'll be viewing would be helpful for people so you'll see I have the a typical age range and gender distribution, pink for female, blue for male, white for equal in both genders, right? We will do the annual incidence of each of these pathologies per 100,000, that's in green on the second line. I will present icons representing the risk factors in red, the percentage mortality, uh, for that entity. And then last, the CT sensitivity. All of these stats were taken from the uh, NCBI, the National Center for Biometric Information. Okay, corneal ectopic. Ectopics in general, 25 to 35 year old females. Corneal ectopics make up about 3 or 4 percent of all ectopics. So they're uh, fortunately a small percentage of all ectopics. The ectopic itself is an incidence of about 20 out of 100,000, so certainly not rare. But that puts our, uh, our corneal ectopic at a pretty low number, um, basically one per 100,000. The risk factors are infection, surgery, and previous ectopic. The mortality is low. That is actually the mortality for all ectopics. I believe it's 2.5%. The mortality for corneals is significantly higher than that. I was not able to find a specific mortality for it, uh, but I can tell you uh, in my review of medical malpractice cases, I looked at four years of cases. There were only two cases of ectopic, and this is for for VRAD, a practice that reads 7 million studies a year, right? there were only two cases of ectopic in a four-year stretch that resulted in a medical malpractice. Both of them were corneal ectopics. These are the ones you have to worry about. Fortunately, the CT is quite sensitive at about 98%. Okay, so the main thing you're going for here is looking at that rim of myometrium surrounding the entirety of that gestational sac. That's the critical thing. And you can see here, uh, you just don't have that. We've got myometrium back here, a little bit of a claw sign, but this whole portion of the gestational sac looks like it may be uh, exposed to the peritoneum. So in addition, there's this intraperitoneal extravasation. There is a lot of hyperdense fluid throughout the abdomen. And this is one of those unusual extravasation situation, see where it's burrowing through all the clot. Right? It looks for all the world almost like a vessel that should be there, that extravasation. Right? So there's that gestational sac without a full covering of myometrium. So look at all that fluid and there is that extravasation. It's burrowing a tract through pre-existing intraperitoneal clot. And you can see that if you look really closely, that uh, intraperitoneal fluid is hyperdense and heterogeneous, starting right about there. But that is uh, that interesting phenomenon. This is uh, clearly a, a uterine vessel that has ruptured, it's actively bleeding. And you can definitely tell that that is a corneal. I think this is probably the best view, but it certainly was apparent on the axial. Look at that. You can see the myometrium right here. Right, and no myometrial covering for a good third of that gestational sac. And there's the extravasation. Very nice view of it, right? You can really see that that is out in the cornua, is not in the endometrial cavity proper. Okay, so that's a corneal ectopic. An aortocaval fistula, these are pretty unusual. Aortic, in fact, I couldn't get a lot of specific information on these, and so I had to go with aortic aneurysm rupture for our data here. So the aortic aneurysm rupture happens to men over 70, uh, 
the aortocapal fistula specifically is about 5% of all aortic ruptures. An aortic rupture in and of itself is about a 15 per 100,000 incidence. Okay, the risk factors are hypertension, smoking, and age. And the mortality for this particular one, we're going to be looking at an aortic aneurysm that ruptures into the IVC. For this particular one, the mortality is low. It's only about 7% because the rupture remains contained. Other ruptures. If you uh, have a previous diagnosis and an observed rupture, you're still looking at about a 62% mortality. And if you go and rupture your aorta out in the wild, that mortality uh, is about 88%. So you're very unlikely to make it. CT scans about 98, 99% sensitive for these. So uh, I do like to review the places where you can rupture your aortic aneurysm uh, on this one. So it can, of course, go intraperitoneal, direct intraperitoneal. You're never going to see one of those on a CT scan. I've never seen one. I've had uh, residents say, oh, I've got one for you, and they send it to me, and it's not. It's a retroperitoneal. Uh, right. When you rupture direct into the peritoneum, your blood pressure drops so fast, you're never going to make it to a hospital. Uh, so there is intraperitoneal, though you're likely not going to see it. The most common is retroperitoneal. Those are the ones contained in the retroperitoneum that run down the iliacs into the pelvis. That's definitely the most common one that you'll see. And that's sufficiently contained where that patient can make it to, uh, to the hospital in some cases. The other two places your aortic aneurysm can rupture, of course, you know, the duodenum, that's most commonly associated uh, with people who've had prior aortic surgeries, right? And then the IVC, which is this one. So you can see already that IVC is distended. It's very dense with contrast. And we've got uh, hepatic venous backflow, uh, which all represent actually retrograde venous flow, as we'll see on the movie. This is an interesting phenomenon. You can see, again, very dense IVC, but note it is more dense than the adjacent left renal vein. That is retrograde flow going from the IVC into the left renal vein. And in fact, the left renal vein ought to be the first uh, you know, uh, venous return coming into the IVC in the opposite direction. Here is the cause of all the trouble. We've got a big aortic aneurysm and a rupture into the adjacent IVC. And then lower down, you can see retrograde venous flow here, filling the iliacs in the same phenomenon we saw in the left renal vein, right? That the left common iliac is unopacified, but it's opacifying the proximal portion of it, right, with retrograde flow. All wrong. All right, there is the distended IVC with retrograde hepatic venous flow. And there is that retrograde left renal venous flow. Here is the aneurysm with the rupture. And again, retrograde flow down into the iliacs. Let's look at that one more time. Yeah, I always remember uh, the first one of these I saw, I, I had never seen this in residency. And so I was out in private practice at an imaging center and this came across the uh, the table and I my eyes just popped out of my head. And, and I always remember I returned to my residency sometime after that and I brought this case to show. Uh, it was actually that case, it was not this exact one. Uh, and I remember showing it to the residents and one resident raised his hand and said, what'd you do? <laughs> and I said, uh, clearly showing I had evolved and was a new kind of private practice uh, diagnostician. I said, are you kidding? I was at an imaging center. I called an ambulance. So the ambulance did come and get that guy and he did well. Nice 3D here. You can see that big aneurysm. You can see the communication with the IVC and that initial thing I was pointing at, that's the uh, retrograde hepatic venous flow. So pretty neat 3D. You can see again the retrograde hepatic venous uh, opacification, there's that communication between the aneurysm and IVC. So let that go around one more time. All right, 
That is an aortic aneurysm to IVC fistula. Our last case in this section is meningococcal sepsis. This is most common in males under one year of age. There is a second incidence in the late teens, early 20s. That usually corresponds to things like summer camp or early college, right? When you uh, go away from home and you're put together with people from all over the place, uh, that's when this stuff breeds. So the incidence is thankfully very low, one in a million. The risk factors are age, as we uh, cited above, socioeconomic factors and institutionalization are all risks. The mortality of meningococcal infection in and of itself is about 40%. I would rate meningococcal sepsis at 90% or even higher. I don't think I've seen anyone truly sepsis, septic uh, with meningococcus actually survive, or the one that did survive was certainly uh, wishing for death. Uh, and lastly, CT sensitivity. I chose not to rate this because it's not the kind of thing you typically diagnose on CT. But uh, that didn't stop our guy. Uh, this is actually an old case. This goes back 14 or 15 years ago. It was one of my colleagues at VRAD that made this call. Uh, dense consolidation of the right lower lobe consistent with pneumonia. A very flat IVC suggesting severe hypotension. You've got periportal edema uh, also suggesting under perfusion. There's been a splenectomy, which is an important contributory finding, right? These uh, encapsulated bacteria are most virulent in patients without spleens. As we go down lower, you see again that flattened IVC barely there, the periportal edema. The hypodense renal parenchyma, those kidneys are almost unperfused. And then, of course, look at those adrenal glands. Slightly enlarged, perhaps, but very dense, either enhancing or hemorrhaging, uh, as is consistent with this entity. One more cut lower down. There again, the flattest IVC you'll see, and markedly hypoperfused kidneys, all consistent with sepsis syndrome and hypo perfusion, hypotension, right? So there is the initial infection and pneumonia, the flattened IVC all the way down, barely has any blood in it at all. There's the periportal edema, the splenectomy, and the dense adrenal glands, and the hypoperfused kidneys. So my colleague, Tosif, he made this call. He called the ER. The interesting thing about these is that this patient probably is too far gone, right? You're probably, by making this call, you're probably not going to save this patient's life, and that was, in fact, the case. Uh, this patient did not make it, and as you can see, it's, it was tragic. She was a young female. Uh, but you're making this call for the other people in that hospital because uh, based on the CT findings here, uh, he suggested the diagnosis that ultimately led to its verification, and it led to you know, all the appropriate public health measures that kept everyone else in that ER and hospital safe. So there, this was contained. There were no other outbreaks, and uh, I think that is uh, my colleague's credit.